Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. My intent is to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature is in us? I will be featuring authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth helps us create bridges. We'll see what's trending what's relevant to our world today, not just for land use, but to connect the dots between ourselves and nature. It's time for practical action and profound inner change so our natural world is valued once again. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to Andrea and Matthias Ryson. They are the owners of Healing Spirits Herb Farm. Hi, Andrea and Matthias. Welcome. Hello, Judith. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I have to tell my listeners that I studied with Matthias many years ago in my beginning journey with herbalism. He was a teacher with Rosemary Gladstar, and it was a profound learning experience because it didn't just include facts. It included working with nature, being responsive to nature. <clears throat> Uh, understanding how nature speaks to us and this is why I'm delighted to have you folks here today because I know you're so connected to the natural world with all that you do and all that you share. Could you tell us, tell my listeners about your experience in the herbal field? Well, we uh, have been growing uh, medicinal plants for about 25 years now, a little over 25 years and uh, before that we were connected as far as uh, working with the earth uh, as dairy farmers so not too many people know that but then we transitioned into growing medicinal herbs so uh, it's been a, a very interesting journey we've uh, met a lot of interesting people and uh, you know you talked about collect, uh, connecting the dots uh, I think one of the, the best ways of connecting the dots of getting us more connected to the earth is getting your your hands in the earth, your hands in the soil. Getting dirty, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Playing with the dirt. I agree. We used to do a class here called Dirty Fingernails. Did you? And it was a three-day class for people to come and learn how to do what we do. Harvest herbs, plant herbs, dry herbs, some of the techniques that we had come up with. And that was basically the idea of get, getting your fingernails dirty and, and uh, making that connection with the plants. Well, we could romance the use of herbalism, right? But the, the reality is you got to get dirty. you got to get out there. You sweat. you got to harvest. It's hot. The bees are out. You know, maybe the mosquitoes are out. you got to get out there and do it in order to understand how the plants work, right? Absolutely. And a good example of that, I think, is Japanese knotweed. Do you want to yeah. talk about that or should I? Well, you know, I think we're being presented with a lot of different invasives. In, in our society today as far as the plants too but they have their their uh, message that they want to bring us and uh, you know it's a it's learning what that message is and one of the things Japanese knotweed is used a lot in lime and lime has a way of burying itself in the body but how Japanese knotweed grows it has a big knot and then from that, little rootlets or average size rootlets come out, and then you have a tap root that goes down further, and then you have another big knot, and then you have the same thing, all these fingers coming out again, all the roots, and then it goes down again. And this can go down 10 and 12 feet. Wow. And and so, you know, it's it's looking at, okay, what does that, that plant want to teach us about the particular illness that we're working with and I think knotweed is a good example of saying the spirochetes bury themselves very deeply within our body but the the maze of roots that are created by Japanese knotweed confuse the spirochetes and uh, allow 
than a person to heal. So it's looking at all these different avenues of how how the plants can can heal you. So do you do you have personal experience using knotweed or anybody in your family or your classes? Um, not us personally because we haven't gotten it. Thank mm-hmm. goodness. Yeah. But a lot of people around us have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we harvest probably what five five six hundred pounds of dried knotweed a year. Wow. You, and it doesn't invade your farm. You have it managed somehow. No, we. One of the advantages of living in this rural area, before I, we were dairy farmers, I worked for a cooperative extension. And I know most of the farmers, and I know how the land has been managed in various areas. We've been here for 40 years. And there are stands of knotweed that have been here for 40 years and not touched by anybody. So we don't actually plant it on our farm. We actually wildcraft it in other safe area, other areas around the within about a two mile area of our farm. So we don't really per se bring any invasives in, but they're there for our use. I agree with you. I think there's um, a lot of fear that's been generated about our invasives. I, I met someone years ago in the Brewster, New York area on the 684 corridor. There's a beautiful stream there, and he was monitoring loose strife, interestingly enough. And he felt that it had a different timing to its life cycle versus what we're used to. So he felt maybe loose strife has to be there for 27 years instead of seven to really help clean up the waterway because that was one of its job as a as a, a plant that comes next to our waterways. It helps clean up the pollution. Have you found that to be true? Yes, we have found that to be true. And it's interesting because in this area, purple loose stripe has been around a long time, and we're finding it leaving certain areas. Uh, and ah. I think it's because its job is done. Right, right. Well, if we get back to Knotwood then, what I'm hearing in your story and use of it is that you're doing responsible, su- sustainable wild crafting. And that's something I would stress to my students, too. What's the difference between wild crafting and organically growing? And in this situation, you're you're going into the wild. Uh, Matthias, from the way you taught, I know you don't strip an area. You're very mindful of the plants and the habitat that you, you seek your plants from. And so there's a sustainability with the wild crafting that's going on. Am I correct? Yeah, definitely. We have to look at, I mean... If we can grow the crops organically and and do that job well, uh, but there are certain crops that are are invasives. We still have to look at them as a, a management type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, some we can, I don't know, as we could ever eliminate Japanese knotweed. <laughs> it's very, very uh, because it goes so deep into the soil. But we've been harvesting in the same area uh, for about 10 years now, and and it's still very sustainable. So it's just going into, and this is a large area. It's probably a four or five acre area. So we harvest just a small section each year. And by the time we get back to the first section, it's it's replenished itself. So it's, it's looking at that way, and it's, and it's looking at our other plants that, are not invasives that we really have to look at managing sustainably. Just for example, uh, high bush cranberry or, or a cramp bark uh, is one that has to be looked at if we're going to, it takes probably seven, eight years before we can actually harvest it. So we gotta be constantly thinking about how do we, we replenish that supply. I agree with you, but that's where we get into sustainability, you know, and that's where we get into respect for the environment, paying attention, what's there, what's not there, what's growing, how long is it lasting, making the observation that a plant is moved out of an area, perhaps, as Andrea mentioned, its job is done. We don't seem to have that awareness yet. We don't seem to connect the dot there yet. 
Uh, so I'm really grateful that you can reinforce it from your vast experience. You've been around the world. You've seen plant species uh, in various farms and gardens. And I think that's a, a wonderful point to make. So you say that you're, grow you're growers. You've been growing for herbalism, uh, medicinal plants for a long time. What do you see uh, is the most pressing issue or a pressing issue in the field of herbalism? I think it's regulation. I, um, In what way? Okay, like we see plants are are really really helpful to the human body. Uh, let's take comfrey mm -hmm. for an example. It's been used for thousands and thousands of years, and all of a sudden now we're being told not to use it internally. Um, and so the majority of people don't use it because they're afraid of it and yet it's a plant that has been used for so long and is so nutritive and healing to the body so I guess it bothers me that people that don't know anything about herbs haven't studied herbs are making these decisions on what we can and cannot use for ourselves and other herbalists it doesn't make any difference because we know the plants and we know that they're safe to take and how to use them, but other people are afraid of them. And I find that sad. One of the other things is we just, a good friend of ours, Conrad Richter of Richter's Herbs, last year we were at one of a conference and he gave a, a talk to the, the title was Plants Have Rights Too. Ah, oh, that's a great title. And and what he's talking about is we have all these different regulatory agencies and uh, they eliminate the uh, transport of herbs from one area to the other uh, like what he was talking about was salvia diva, uh, salvia divinora which is considered sometimes a uh, phytotropic or psychotropic drug but you know as we eliminate the use of certain herbs we're also eliminating a whole our whole connection with the knowledge of that plant that cannot be shared so it's it's all through the world people are eliminating or saying this herb is not good, this herb is not good. Pretty soon, we've eliminated a fair majority of our medicinal herbs. You know, we look at kava, we look at valerian, like you chaparral. know, chaparral. You know, we can't in Iceland. You can't use valerian. Hmm. Why? Okay. I, just different laws in different countries, and so we need to have. Uh, you know, a Food Freedom Act or a, a an act that allows us as herbalists and as human beings to have the choice to our own medicine. I agree with you. I just came across a school, uh, a new school in Bali that's environmental and they have the children totally in outside environments for their different classes and the kids love it they just absolutely love it and children go there from all over the world but the the one of the founders said kids will fall down kids will get hurt they need to do that in order to learn i feel that's the same principle that you're that you're uh, bringing out to us with the world of plants yes some plants may have some untoward effects but there are people in your community that know how to use them, so find them. Why aren't we more proactive in our communities for learning how to use them or what to do uh, instead of having to have it regulated? And I agree with you. The regulation is simply based on fear. It's not based on knowledge, uh, experience, and the use of the plants in a healthy and correct manner. Do you see any trends going on in the herbal world? I think there's always trends. It's um, there's always somebody that's talking about some herb, and it's going to be up for a year or two, mm -hmm. and then somebody else talks about another herb. Right. 
and, and that's good and it's bad, it, but it's just what it is. But I think what's really important is when a trend comes along, it's nice because a lot of times you can get more information. Mm-hmm. But to really have your roots firmly planted in the plants that you know, the plants that you use every day, and maybe not be so quick to just jump on a bandwagon until you have played with that herb. The herb has come into your body, has talked to you, and you really have a good understanding of that herb and how it works. I think one of the examples is, you know, a number of years ago, I think probably 15, maybe 20, we, we came across this new herb called ashwagandha. And, yeah. uh, you know... Uh, we started using it a little bit and uh, started growing it and then you know it took us about three or four years before we really had a connection with that plant because it's something that wasn't grown in this part of the world and I think now you know it's a well established herb here and a lot of people uh, do grow it, and uh, it's a great analog for American ginseng, and and a lot uh, easier to grow. Hmm. That's interesting. What I what I see or tend to find in the media is that they'll pick up on an herb, and they'll say it's bad, but if we look at the way the herb was originally used. You know, some of the herbs that come from Asia have always been used in a formula. They're not really given singly like we do in Western herbs. So I think we have to understand the traditional use, too, before we start jumping to conclusions, whether it's good or it's not good. Have you found that to be so? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yes, and it's... Don't you think, too, part of it is our Western way or the way in the United States also something has to be good or bad? Right. It, we, we don't want it to be complicated. We, we don't uh, want to look at all the individual things going on. And I also I think sometimes it's kind of like a movie star. We have a movie star that we like. And that movie star, maybe, if they're lucky, has a five-year run before somebody else comes in and that person, there has to be something bad about them because they're no longer popular. And I see that happening in the herbal world a lot. And like you said, they have to be, herbs a lot of times are like people. They need to be mixed together. And I think the Orient understood this a lot better than we do. And that's why so many of their herbs were used in formulas because they balanced one another out. I agree. And that's what I appreciate about that system is the fact that they're balanced. Um, the other part of, of the trends, uh, you talked about getting more information. I find that uh, a lot of it is planned information and... Does that impact your business in any way? You know, the powers that be, these big companies, they decide to make X plant uh, the uh, plant du jour of the year, and then that seems to, everybody's scrambling for it. Have you seen things like that happen in your business? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to plan for that. It is. Because it don't give you any warning, it's just there. Right. What that does do, though, for us, when people call up and they want that herb, Mm -hmm. And if we don't have or we have a limited supply of it, we can talk to them about how that herb works and what other herbs there are that might work just as well. That's great. Or maybe, Go ahead. Or maybe that particular herb isn't right for their body type. So it does give us a, a place to communicate. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, a, lo a lot of times mm -hmm. Go ahead. people come in with a preset idea of what herb they're going to use because they've read about it in, in one particular article or another when it may not actually be like Andrea said it may not actually be the right herb for their their body for their particular illness or what is going on overall in their in their health field so that's where I think uh, communicating 
with a uh, with a good herbalist and also taking the time to communicate with the plant to have an awareness of what 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 is what's that plant even look like that I'm putting in my body you know a lot of people uh, want the quick fix they want the pill they want it encapsulated and they they don't take the time to make a cup of tea see what the herbs actually look like going into that tea and and how it tastes going down their their you know their how their taste buds accept it how their stomach accepts it as opposed to just throwing a pill in and, and uh, hitting the stomach and exploding down there and and getting out in nature and making that connection is well I'm taking uh, pine pollen uh, what's it, what time of year do I collect it uh, how do I collect it and what you know how is it made and Maybe they don't have to know all these things, but at least have some concept of of uh, awareness of, of the plant in its own natural habitat. I agree with you. That gets us into, you know, you have you offer many spiritually based programs in working with nature. And one of the things that I loved when I worked with you and Rosemary, you know, in the herbal school was giving thanks that simple simple action of giving thanks for what we're ingesting uh i don't that could be a easy an easy practice to incorporate in our everyday life just simply giving thanks for that plant whether we know anything about it or not i worked in the health food industry for over 14 15 years and people would come in looking for herbs or supplements with the same mentality that they brought into the pharmacy what do you have it's going to work now because i'm stressed out i got a cold i got to get to work i got to do this and i need something now you know so that's kind of um part of our culture that we're still working with in ter- terms of changing and I think it's happening it's happening on a grassroots level little by little here and there you folks certainly contribute to that so tell tell us about your uh, I don't know how to word it but your spiritually based programs what makes your heart sing when you work with nature and your connection with nature well I think one of the biggest things that makes uh, gladdens my heart is when I can take people out on an herb walk and and just introduce them to so many different plants and, and make a have a consciousness of what is it that we are surrounded by the the many different medicines that we sometimes walk on in the lawn and our gardens that and there are gardens that we weed out on our lawns that we walk on that we're not even conscious of I'm going to interrupt you, but talk about the tobacco for the plants and things oh, like that. Oh, I mean, before we harvest, I mean, we always give an offering. And and that can be as simple as a prayer or a tobacco offering or, you know, singing a song. So it's just honoring the plants for the medicine that they give us each and every day. And we also do we also do ceremony before we start the greenhouse in the in the winter time. Mm-hmm. We'll usually do um, for us it's usually a pipe ceremony. Mm-hmm. And one time we had a friend come over that has a beautiful gong that's very deep, mm-hmm. and we did that and awakened the plants, it awakened the seeds, just anything to help connect in so that you're connected to that seed that plant and it's aware that you're just not taking that you realize it's a life that it has its own it has its own role it has its own feelings and there's a mutual respect yes and that's that's a dot i really really want to connect with this work is the idea that if we approach nature from a place of respect it could be as simple as saying thank you or as elaborate as a ceremony Um, the plants respond the nature responds to us and the kids know this I think children know this innately but they get we kind of work it out of them because we keep them inside it was very exciting to see this school with this exuberance of children eager to learn in this 
beautiful outdoor environment that they're creating and they're hoping to have more schools like that around the world but the kids are with the plants they're with the trees you know how best to know a tree by climbing it you climb up it you feel the bark you know you see the bugs that hang out there you know what I'm saying uh, we can do all of those mm-hmm. things to to create a bridge on that level and um, that that also tells me and I would like our listeners to really understand that when you do a ceremony as you mentioned for the seeds uh, your herbs probably have a different vibrational quality to them and that's the part we can't easily measure unless you know of science that are happening on that level I don't think you can measure it all on a scientific level. Maybe you can. I don't know about it. Hmm. But what you can measure it on is people call us or write us all the time and say, I got your herbs, and I can't believe I could feel the vibration as I was taking them out of the package. I could smell the herb. I can taste the herb. And they also tell us, like people that don't have... That say are ordering from us for the first time, they don't know us personally. Somebody told them to get an herb from us, and they'll say, "I could feel the love," and I never experienced that before. So I think that's the where um, maybe it's not the scientific way, but it certainly is the human way. Yes, and I don't feel that should be discounted. You know, science has its purpose, and our technologies allowing us to do many different kinds of testing, which is great. But it seems ironic to me that the science is proving what our ancestors knew for thousands of years (laughs) prior to to the scientific (laughs) test, you know? Uh, So I understand that you do um, a lot of classes. Do you have anything coming up? Well, uh, let's see. What do we have got? Actually, we're doing a class out in uh, in Fallon, Nevada, hmm. at a food hub, and we we uh, are just discussing, you know, what we do here on the farm and trying to uh, obviously educate, but also there's an interest out there uh, of people making uh, value-added products. And so we're going to focus on that a little bit, but just talk about some of the herbs that are out there and what what they might be able to do with that and, and the products that they might be able to, to make. And it, go ahead. I'm going to interrupt here. One of the things that we really like is when we can go and help people that are interested. They want to they want to work with the plants. They would like to be able to make some money, make a living, and be able to quit the job that they have that they don't like but they're not quite sure how to do it and because we've done it for so long we can go in and say this is how we've done it doesn't mean that you can't do it differently but this is how we've done it and it's easy and you can do it too well I I can only say this they're in for a treat because you too are a wealth of experience and I know I love learning from you and all that you've done over the years with your farm and the wild crafting and harvesting you've done of plants because they're beautiful and you give the respect that's like we've said is missing in some of our agricultural practices I remember years ago David Winston said you know when he and his the Cherokee people would use ginseng it would be a seven day ceremony you know you'd have to go out there in the woods harvest it yourself for your own product plus a ceremony you would sweat you'd have to build a fire blah 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 for the seven days and I would say to my students you know compare that to walking into a pharmacy and just picking something up off the shelf that has been mass produced and while there is some life force there I don't believe it's the maximum life force of that plant so we're actually missing out yes absolutely uh, it was interesting one time years ago we did a class with on uh, Nam Singh who is uh, a herbalist from California mm-hmm. um, and he was talking about ginseng and in China it was the same thing they did it once a year it was a week-long ceremony yeah. and 
asked it ahead of time. There was this whole ritual that went with it. And we need to get back more into ritual. And we can have a ritual just by having a cup of tea. Exactly. There's no ritual around the pill. But if you make a cup of tea, you you can make a lovely ritual out of it and really connect to that plant. I agree. And you have that experience. I know I have that experience. And it's something we want to share with others to get back into that, again, respect for the natural world. I think one of the things as people, one of the things that's kind of lacking in, in the, the teachings around various conferences is that we always talk about, well, this does this for our body. This herb does this. This is a good, you know, uh, antiseptic. It's a good uh, diuretic. It's a good uh, diaphoretic. But we don't actually ask our students or the people, our classes, what, how does that plant make us feel? Mm. Write down, put your thoughts down, do some poems, poetry, whatever. Just put down your feelings of what that plant actually means to you. You know, is it, is it stands in the field, its beauty, its elegance, uh, maybe how it feels in your body. Does it, you know, enliven you? Does it make you happy? All these emotions that we sometimes forget about because that's another part. We're, we're all connected and we all have these, co these connections of emotions between one another. And until we figure this out, that connection that we are all connected and the emotions that we have are connected, uh, we have a journey before us. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. I think, again, our Eastern, or, uh, in the Eastern traditions, there is a value in poetry and artwork, uh, in the mindfulness practices of just being. So if we want to just be, as you said, Andrea, with a cup of tea, and if it inspires us to do poetry in that moment, well, why not? That's all part of the connection. It's lovely. Well, folks, I would, uh, for our time is winding down here. Um, I'm so grateful to the both of you. Uh, please tell our listeners all your contact information. And, on, and Matthias, if you do a class on the emotions and plants, let me know. Because <laughs> <laughs> we'll put it out there. I think that would be a great topic for, uh, for connecting with the plants. Okay. Well, uh, Judith, thank you for uh, inviting us on uh, for this interview and it's been wonderful uh, our contact information is just our, we're on the web at healing spirits herb farm and dot com, dot com and uh, all our information is on there as far as phone number and email and our phone number, our, our phone number uh, 607 566 2701 and we're located in western New York, so... Uh, in the beautiful Finger Lakes region. So. Yes. And you have a great mail order business, too, so folks can call and get some right. advice and, and purchase the plants, which is wonderful. Well, a great morning. I want to say thank you to everyone for joining all of us today at The Holistic Nature of Us. I hope you feel as inspired as I do by Andrea and Matthias Rice and their talk, their practical advice. I know I do, um, and I'm so grateful they could be here today. So this is Judith Dreyer, author of At the Garden Skate book and blog. For more information, go to my website, judithdreyer.com. You will find information for this podcast, and the transcript of the podcast will also be avail available, as well as my book, blog, and class schedules. And I like to end with a quote on uh, Healing Spirits Farm website. A wonderful woman by the name of Kimberly wrote a, a great article on her connection to the burdock plant and how she learned about her anger and worked through her anger because she had a harvest for you folks, I think for a day or so, mm -hmm. uh, with the burdock. And she says, plants are excellent teachers because they don't interrupt the internal work being done done. They are a conscious presence holding space with us. 
It's a beautiful way to end. I want to thank you again and enjoy your day, everyone. Signing off, this is Judith.